thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak in the member seminar. Um, I'd like to tell you today about some of what we know about finite covers of three manifolds and, and how it ties together the topology of, of the manifold with its geometry. Um, and then, uh, as I'll explain, it also brings arithmetic into the picture. So my goal is to give a, my plan is to give a sort of colloquium style talk. Um, so please feel free to interrupt me if I fail to, to reach my goal. Um, and those of you who are three manifold topologists should expect to doze lightly uh, for the first 20 minutes. OK, so um, the context is I'd like to think about, um, uh, let's just say, a closed, orientable, connected three manifold. Um, and so the sort of things you should be thinking of here would be perhaps the three-dimensional sphere or um, the three-dimensional torus, S1 cross S1 cross S1, or maybe, I don't know, the product of a surface, let's say a surface of genus 2 with the circle, or maybe a lens space, LPQ, some whatever standard examples of these things you've encountered before. Um, and the basic framework that I'll use to study these three manifolds is the geometric perspective introduced by Thurston and uh, proved in generality by Perlman. Um, and that is that, so this is something that started uh, in the late 70s. Perlman proved the, what's called the geometrization conjecture. I guess I should call it the geometrization theorem uh, about 10 years ago. Um, so the perspective here is that uh, any such manifold um, has what's called a geometric decomposition. Um, so it can be cut into pieces uh, along certain embedded surfaces um, so that the surfaces admit some kind of nice geometry. Um, and the specifics of this uh, decomposition won't be important for today because very quickly, I'll, uh, I will uh, focus on the um, generic and least understood case. Uh, but just to look at the manifolds on our list, right? the three-dimensional sphere has a nice round metric sitting as the unit ball in R4. Um, the three-dimensional torus, we could think about that as the quotient of three-dimensional Euclidean space by Andrew Lattice of translations. Um, this would have a nice metric on it, which was basically a product of a hyperbolic metric on the circle. Oh, sorry, a hyperbolic metric on the surface uh, with the circle. So that's kind of a product thing. Uh, the lens spaces, those are spherical. Again, they're quotients of um, S3 by a nice cyclic group action. Um, but as I said, the, the generic case, and this way I won't have to tell you exactly what the cutting is and what the details of this are. Uh, the generic case, or the generic Maybe I'll just call it the key case, is when your three manifold uh, has a hyperbolic metric. So it has just some metric, Ramani metric of constant curvature. Let's say constant curvature minus one. Um, and so today I'm just going to focus on this. I'm just going to always focus on the hyperbolic case. It takes non-trivial work to reduce the sort of more general questions I'll sometimes state things as to the hyperbolic case. But in the end, this is where, for these questions, the hard work um, and the real interest will lie. Other questions so far? So I wanted to talk about finite covers. That was my title, right? Um, and uh, so a corollary of the geometrization theorem is that, with the exception of the first guy here, the three-sphere, any closed oriented three-manifold has a non-trivial finite cover. I'll just I'll, I'll stop writing oriented. Everything will be oriented. Any closed M3 has a non-trivial finite cover. Or equivalently, you're of a more algebraic turn of mind. It's just saying that the fundamental group of M 
So are any closed three manifold? Not the three sphere. Any other manifold, its fundamental group will be non-trivial. Um, and what this is saying is simply that that group contains a subgroup of finite index. So pi 1 of m has a proper subgroup of finite index. So there is some nice, this is just going to be some other closed uh, oriented three manifold mapping down to m. It's nice local, local homeomorphism. Each point has the same number of, of preimages. Uh, the existence of this cover is it's a corollary of this. Um, and in fact, the only known way to prove this, which is very sort of purely topological or algebraic fact, depending on your perspective, actually comes from um, the geometrization theorem. So to get us started, uh, let me just explain what, what, what's the connection between having a geometry, in particular having a hyperbolic geometry, um, and this covers. And then I'll say something about the rest of my talk. We'll tell you something about what we know um, about these, these covers. Given some concrete three manifold, if you start to unwind its topology a little by passing it to finite covers, what sort of things can you see? So. Let me just explain this corollary. So let me sort of give you the proof or a sketch of the proof when m is hyperbolic. Uh, so you can think of a hyperbolic metric as just a Ramanian metric of constant curvature minus 1. Uh, but you could also think of it, as we did for the three-dimensional torus up there, you can think of it as the quotient of, in this case, the hyperbolic three space um, by the action of the fundamental group, by the action of some discrete group. So just um, hyperbolic three space here is just the um, set of points, let's say in R3, the open ball, um, say everything distance less than one from the origin, uh, together with the Ramanian metric, which, well, it's a conformal change. So angles will look right, but distance will, will be wildly distorted. So there's some factor here the details of which are not important, um, except for the fact, well, I mean, the details are important. But for today's talk, the thing to notice just is that as you move towards the boundary, uh, the metric gets bigger and bigger. So something that in the middle might appear to ha have, say, I don't know, area 1 or whatever, well, not area 1, but area 10th, if you were to move this thing towards the boundary, from our perspective, it will shrink, even though in the hyperbolic metric, it remains the same. So you have this nice metric. It contains the, the equilateral, sorry, the um, equatorial plane here. That's a copy of hyperbolic space, hyperbolic plane, which you might visualize often as like the upper half space. So there's, you know, it's got geodesics, just arcs of circles, which meet the sort of boundary. It's not technically part of the hyperbolic space at right angles. Um, and so I'd like to now think of my hyperbolic three manifold as a quotient of hyperbolic three space by, so this is the universal cover of my manifold, by the action of its fundamental group, which is going to be acting by isometries. So what this is just telling us, maybe I'll put it over here, is that the fundamental group of M, it's saying this is some nice subgroup of the group of isometries of H3 which it turns out is just the Lie group of two by two matrices of determinant one, um, I guess, modulo the center. So these, you can think of these, if you like, as Mobius transformations. They're acting on here on the spirit and affinity, and it's extended to the whole thing in, in some way that makes this natural. So OK, so the, given a hyperbolic manifold, um, its group is a, a bunch of matrices, and then the reason one has this corollary is the following fact um, that any finitely, any finitely generated group of matrices uh, has finite quotients. Which will correspond to subgroups, normal subgroups of finite index. Um, and the 
basic picture for this, I mean, this, is, this will seem like an, an example, but in fact, it contains all uh, the actual ideas. Um, the simplest group of matrices I can think of is the two by two matrices with integer entries. Um, and if I wanted to find a quotient of this, well, I could just take um, my matrices and reduce the entries, say, modulo o prime, like modulo 11. So you get a map to PSL2, Z, adjoin, Z mod, I guess it doesn't have to be prime, just some, some number n. Uh, it turns out this is surjective. It's not so hard to see. Um, and so therefore, if you take the kernel of this thing, Uh, you get a subgroup whose index is whatever the order of this thing is. Um, so this is what's called a congruent subgroup. And you might say, well, of course, this is a very special group of matrices. But the fact that fundamental group of my manifold here, compact manifold, is going to be finitely generated, you'll get matrices um, whose entries live, well, not necessarily in Z, but in some finitely generated ring over Q. Um, and so there will be enough ideals in this ring that you'll be able to pull exactly the same trick. Other questions? So, um, right, so this is a corollary of geometrization. There is no other known way to establish this. Um, it really, to me, is that's kind of. Yeah, I mean, you might think there should be some more sort of hands-on, concrete way to do this. But in fact, the way the proof works, if to show this statement, what you do, someone hands you this manifold and says, find me a finite cover. Well, you take some arbitrary Ramanian manif metric on this manifold, some bumpy thing. You flow it under Hamiltonian's, Hamilton's Ricci flow. Uh, Perlman proves that, well, bad things can happen. Singularities form in finite time. Um, but Perlman shows how to classify these and how to sort of move past them, get on with your life. Uh, and then in the end, what you're left with is this nice, um, typically in the generic case, a very analytic thing, namely a hyperbolic metric on your manifold. Um, and from that analyticity, uh, it means that your fundamental group is actually a group of matrices. And from that, you can extract some algebra. So perhaps there's a, a simpler proof of this, but certainly no one knows what it is. Are there questions so far? No, because right. So the next thing I want to talk about is is Ian's work on the virtual Hawking conjecture. But to answer your question now, the point is that that assumes you have a hyperbolic manifold to start with, because you need to apply Kahn Markovich to. That's true. That's true, but you're still using, to prove this statement, you're still using the existence of hyperbolic tr structure. Well, I agree with that. Yes, that's right. OK, so um, the results of, of Ian's, that let me just sort of, I think my abstract said I would make a passing, wave my hands at this. So what Ian showed um, is that, uh, OK, so now we know we have finite index subgroups. We have covers. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is about the um, homology or cohomology of, of these covers. What can we say about it? And what Ian proved is that if um, the fundamental group of your manifold is infinite, uh, then it has a finite cover. Uh, M tilde, where uh, this cover has some non-trivial cohomology. So where the first cohomology of M uh, with integral coefficients, let's say, is not equal to 0. M tilde, thank you. Right. So your original manifold itself might well not have no first cohomology. Um, but if you're willing to unwind the topology a little, what Ian shows is that you can, in fact, find something. Um, so, I mean, geometrically, this is, of course, Poincare dual to H2 of M tilde. So, these are things that can be represented by certain interesting surfaces in your three manifold. That's sort of the origin of the question. Um, but I guess maybe for, for now, let me just point out that this statement is the strongest thing you could hope to show because 
the first cohomology here, right, you can think about that as just equivalent to HOM from the fundamental group of M to Z. So this is saying that, whoops, it's saying that if your fundamental group is infinite, you can find a finite index subgroup which maps onto an infinite abelian group. Right, so this is certainly a necessary, necessary hypothesis. And of course, he improves much more than that, but um, that's, that's a statement that's good enough for today's purposes. Other questions? OK, so what I'd like to talk about today um, is really a, a conjecture. I mean, it is a conjecture. There won't be that many results, um, but a very interesting conjecture about uh, the homology or cohomology of finite covers, which in some sense is, is sort of orthogonal to uh, Ian's result there. Um, right, so if we have, uh, so I, over there I was talking about the cohomology, right? The cohomology, first cohomology, this is just like some z to the n. Right, some free, free thing. Um, so if we look at the homology of this cover, that's going to be going to be some free part. Uh, this free part is the same rank as in the uh, cohomology, and then plus some torsion part. And the free part, I mean, has a sort of natural geometric meaning. It corresponds by universal coefficients or whatever to the cohomology, which corresponds to surfaces and you know, sort of has obvious geometric content. The torsion, or at least the torsion that's primed to two, a priori it doesn't, I mean, it says something about cycles. I mean, homology is a concrete thing, but it's not, if you tell me there's like 11 torsion in this group, I don't know how as a three-manifold topologist to interpret that. Um, it's not like there's some concrete thing I can look at and maybe try to cut out or, or manipulate in some way. Um, but despite that, but this doesn't seem to have initially a, a good meaning. Um, what I'd like to about tell you about today is that in the context of suitable covers of a manifold, it appears that, in fact, um, this torsion group does encode something. Um, it encodes something about, uh, for example, the volume of the manifold. So um, this is probably bad board work. But since I'm going to want to keep this conjecture up, for the rest of the talk, let me go ahead and put it over here. All right, so this is a recent, fairly recent conjecture, last five years. In the form I'll state it, it was proposed by Bergeron uh, and Venkatesh. Um, but there's a closely related form uh, proposed by Thang Lei. Um, and I think you know, ideas like this certainly go back to Luke. Uh, so here's the, the conjecture. Um, is, so suppose uh, M is a hyperbolic. I want it to be a special kind of hyperbolic manifold. Um, so there's a kind that are called arithmetic. Um, so what this means. Well, a working definition of what this means is just a hyperbolic three manifold a number theorist cares about. Um, but really, it means it comes from what we had up here. I just erased SL2Z. It's the three dimensional analog of something like that. It turns out this hypothesis probably can be removed, so let me not belabor it at the moment. Um, so we have this arithmetic hyperbolic three manifold. Um, uh, and suppose we have a tower of finite covers. Right, so we started off with questions about a finite cover. So let me build one. And I thought, oh, that's so much fun. I'll build another. And what can be done before has once before it can be legally be done again. So I want a nice tower of finite covers where, um, well, I'd like to make these. It's kind of technical, so you can ignore it if you like. 
Um, I like each one to make each one of these a regular cover or a Galois cover. So that means there's some finite group, say, acting on M4, which quotients it down to, to M. Um, and I'd also like that somehow this tower of covers um, captures all of the topology of the manifold, in the sense that if I have some loop down here in M, I want it to be unwound some point if you go far enough out this thing. Um, so maybe the shortest way to say it is algebraically. If we think about the fundamental groups of these covers, right? those are subgroups of the fundamental group of M, I'd like to require that they intersect in the identity. So this is still hypotheses. And I also want to assume, let me add this. Here, I want them to be these sort of congruence covers, at least if I want to faithfully copy what they proposed. So th these are things that are obtained by this sort of trick where you take SL2Z and then quotient um, the, the entries. Um, and uh, so then, OK, it's supposed to be a conclusion. Um, so the conclusion is that while in general, the uh, first cohomology of a manifold, hyperbolic or not, um, can be trivial. Uh, what they posit is that if you go far enough out this tower, this group here, eventually the torsion part, let's just say that Ian knows everything there is to know about the free part. Uh, the torsion part, th they claim, is eventually non-zero. Um, and in fact, it's not just non-zero, it's huge. It's going to be its size. Uh, the number of elements of this finite abelian group is going to grow exponentially. Um, and the rate of exponential growth as a function of the volume um, is a universal constant independent of the manifold itself. So the conjecture is that if we take the log of this, divide by the uh, volume of the manifold, take the limit of this as we go to infinity, this is supposed to be equal to 1 over 6 pi. So that's the, that's the statement. It's saying that, well, let me rewrite this um, the following way. Um, well, let's say we want to just rewrite this in just in the terms of the language of, of groups, right? I mean, things like the homology here, that's just the abelianization of the fundamental group. So we take this big, complicated group and we abelianize it. So now let's look at the torsion part. So that's the same as the thing I wrote over there homologically. Uh, now I want to, I'd like to express this denominator here in terms of just something involving the subgroup. So I guess the volume here is the volume of the base manifold times the degree of this cover. Um, and the degree of the cover, I guess, is just the index of this subgroup in the big group. So let me just put that here. The index of the subgroup, pi 1 mn. Um, OK, it's so this times the volume of the base. Let me move that to the other side. So an equivalent formulation of this conjecture is that, it, at least for certain hyperbolic manifolds and certain kinds of covers, uh, you can extract the volume of the manifold from um, the subgroups uh, by just looking at how much, how big is this abelianization. Um, and so this is, I find this very surprising, um, but there is a, something which I haven't mentioned, probably should have, which makes this somewhat less surprising. Um, and that is that uh, one of the reasons that hyperbolic geometry, that this sort of structure theorem of geometrization has so much impact on three-dimensional topology is that Mostow rigidity says that when you have a hyperbolic metric, it's actually unique 
um, up to isometry. Um, so the fundamental group of the manifold, in fact, determines completely uh, the hyperbolic geometry of M. So any two hyperbolic manifolds with the same fundamental group, in this case in dimension three or more, if the fundamental group's the same, the manifolds are the same. And so hence, if you, uh, and this is the sort of origin of, the other part of the origin of Thurston's mantra that geometry and topology are the same in dimension three, is that if I, therefore, if I take any topological description of a three manifold, so for example, if I take the three sphere and remove this knot, well, that's not closed. It's harder for me to draw a closed manifold. I apologize. Um, but this does have a hyperbolic metric of finite volume. And by Mostow, that volume um, is an invariant of that topology. So not only, so the fact that somehow we are extracting, see this side here, this is geometric information. This is really just about subgroups of the fundamental group. The fact that we can read off geometric information from the fundamental group is not shocking. It, Mostow says that there is some connection. What I think is amazing here is that um, the connection has this particular form. Are there questions so far? Well, so it's not really known, actually. So I will talk um, at the end. Uh, so it's definitely the fact that you unwind all the topology, that certainly is necessary. But that the covers be congruent or that the manifold be arithmetic, these, prop, these certainly seem like they can be weakened some of the time. But it's really um, something we don't know much about. Uh, yes, that's right. So um, to, to answer, right, so in fact, there's a good theoretical reasons for why this is true. And I should say that, in the, at least in the case of Bergeron and Venkatesh, I mean, this is really a, a conjecture about uh, lattices in semi-simple groups. So, if you look at SLNR or something, there would be some analogous statement that maybe you have torsion growth, but only in a certain dimension. Um, I'm a small-minded three-manifolds person, so I'm just sticking with this. Um, but there actually is not a single case in which this conjecture is known. Uh, and we do, however, have some numerics. So I thought rather than explain, I mean, there's so good theoretical reasons behind this, but in the interest of time, I thought I would show you pretty pictures instead. OK, so um, what this is a chart of is uh, from my paper with Jeff Brock. Um, we started with uh, 11 arithmetic hyperbolic three manifolds. So they're things that should satisfy the conjecture over there. Um, and for each one of them, we took a lot of different congruence covers. So I think in the end, this is going to be a plot of about 15,000 different covers of these manifolds. Did you say these principles congruent? So yes, so Peter asked of these principles. No, they're not. Um, so technically, they don't quite satisfy uh, this conjecture. But um, good point. Um, so these guys are these congruence covers. And then what's plotted? So this is the volume of the manifold, the cover. The, the manifold the, themselves have volume you know, roughly three or something, and it's small. Um, these are the volumes of, of the covers. Uh, and then what's plotted on this here is just uh, essentially this ratio. But I decided I'd rather have it limit to one. So um, the thing I it's plotted there called uh, the torsion ratio of some manifold n is, by definition, take the size of the torsion part of the homology and divide it by the volume. And then you multiply it by 6 pi. So the conjecture becomes that it's 1. Um, and uh, so here you see that, OK, initially there's lots of um, uh, it sort of spreads out, although it still seems relatively centered around 1. Um, and then as you go up and get to these manifolds with larger and larger volumes, so remember the figure eight knot picture that I had up before had volume two. So these are much, much bigger than something simple like that. Maybe you should imagine like a 
a knot with 15,000 crossings or something, um, uh, it tends to taper down um, very markedly towards the, that line. Are there questions so far? So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's some there's something here that right. I mean, they don't vary wildly, uh, and I mean you can see that uh, the size of this is going to be somehow at most exponential uh, in the volume. At least, yeah. Um, although maybe the constant would depend on m. But yeah, this is somehow much. I, this is quite striking. Ah, what's red and blue? Um, good question. So the glad you asked. The last time I gave this talk, usually when I give this talk, somebody asked this question. Last time I gave this talk, no one did. Put me in a really awkward position. Um, so the red and the blue have to do, I mean, this conjecture is about the torsion in the first homology. But of course, there's also the free part. Uh, and the red versus blue is whether that free part is non-zero. So red is equivalent to the first homology non-zero, and blue is first homology equal zero. So the free part, it's whether there's any free part in addition to the torsion part that's being plotted. Now, if you look at this picture, you actually see the red part sort of seems a little bit slightly below the blue part. Um, and that's made a little more clear in this picture. So this picture, I just lopped off. I threw away all the manifolds whose volume was less than 15,000, uh, the small ones. Um, and then this is just a histogram of the torsion ratio of what's left. So you see it's sort of centered here around 1. Uh, and the red stuff, the stuff with some cohomology, first cohomology, is shifted very slightly um, to the uh, left, slightly lower than the stuff that's blue. And I'll come back to that in a second. All right, so these were uh, arithmetic guys. Uh, they were uh, the things that in the, this formulation of the conjecture. So it turns out that these particular manifolds, yes, Richard. Yes. Oh, well, um, these uh, fields are not necessarily imaginary quadratic. Uh, these are closed. Um, and they're actually constructed from So it was, it was 11 fixed manifolds, and there were congruence covers of those 11 fixed things. Yeah, so they were actually chosen topologically. Um, there was a simple sort of topological construction that turned out to give you both arithmetic and non-arithmetic things. There's, so some of them were arithmetic. That was the one you just saw. But then you could take these other ones, which as a topologist, I couldn't tell you these apart. You give me these things, and I'll say, yeah, they were basically the same kind of thing. But some of them are arithmetic, some of them not. Yes. Uh, they're not not complements. Um, they are technically these are orbifold. So you draw a certain knot in the three sphere, and you label it with some orbifold label, um, and it's a hyperbolic structure which is sort of singular along that with a prescribed cone angle. Yeah, so they're they're not quite manifolds, but you could take a finite cover to get rid of that. Um, so these are the non-arithmetic ones. So in this small topological family, there were 20 non-arithmetic guys, um, and so you can look at the congruence covers of those. Um, so I think this is now buff buffly 30,000 uh, covers. Um, and you can look at the volume. And you can plot this torsion ratio. Um, and uh, what you see here is that, well, uh, generally speaking, it converges, um, except maybe when it doesn't. And that's, well, I mean, who knows? You know, go out. That's an asymptotic statement. Maybe eventually. Yeah, yeah, each, right. Each dot here is one example. Um, so like one thing that changes hugely uh, between the two plots is how much red there is. Right, this is roughly, you can't you eyeball it, but it's about 35% red. This is under 2% is red. All right, so this, this just shows you how hard it is to prove Ian's theorem. Right, this very, if these covers, very few of them. Um, so it's on the order of rank 50, I believe. The rank is big, yeah. Um, so there's something weird going on in the homology in the non-arithmetic case, maybe. Um, but uh, if you exclude those guys, 
then in fact, um, the non-arithmetic ones are converging faster than the arithmetic ones. So here, I'm just looking at the covers where the volume is bigger than 15,000. Um, and I threw out, well, I think in this range, I threw out any low outliers. Um, and so the green here, this is the arithmetic ones from the first plot. See, it's I mean, this is only up to doubt 0 0.94, OK? So it's very clustered around 1. But the non-arithmetic guys are even more strongly clustered at 1. So it's actually converging faster. So, um, so it converges faster, except when it doesn't. That's the summary there. Are there other questions? Yeah, so if the rank is zero, so let me, um, are there, before I do this, are there further questions on this data? Um, so, One reasonable conjecture to make based on the data that I just showed you would be that you can drop um, arithmetic from the original conjecture uh, if you add that uh, the cohomology of these guys is 0. Um, that this is the first cohomology. So this is the free part. The torsion part would still be very large. So something like this may actually give us a name. This is what I would call an integer homology sphere. Oh, sorry, rational. Ah. Something whose rational homology is the same as the three sphere, although its integral homology presumably is not. Um, and uh, so it turns out that there certainly are. So Ian's theorem was that there are covers where this cohomology is uh, non trivial. You could ask, well, I mean, are there any such examples, right, where the you can always, where the cohomology always vanishes. Certainly in the, especially in the arithmet non-arithmetic case, that seems very plausible given the data. There were so few uh, things with bad data number. Uh, but in fact, you can prove. Um, so this is something I did with uh, Frank Caligari. Um, and well, also really Nigel Boston and Jordan Ellenberg. So about 10 years ago, what we showed is that um, there exist uh, sort of towers of congruence covers of both um, arithmetic and non-arithmetic manifolds um, where all the cohomology of the covers vanishes, both arithmetic So if you're careful, um, and you have to, if you pick some particular, you pick the right example and the right kind of congruence cover, and unwind the topology in the right way, um, it turns out that you can arrange that there's sort of no uh, no first cohomology. So Frank and I, our original approach to this was to use sort of the Langlands um, machinery. So in the end, we ruled out the existence of certain Galois representations to conclude this. Um, our proof was conditional on, on the generalized Riemann hypothesis. I don't know if that bothers people in the room. Fortunately, uh, Boston doesn't bother. Uh, yeah, that, that, I guess that's probably true. Fortunately, um, uh, Nidal, Joel, and Jordan were able to uh, reanalyze our examples using just um, the machinery of pro-p groups. Uh, and they were able to give an unconditional proof um, 
uh, that our examples worked. And then you can actually use their ideas to also build some non-arithmetic manifolds. It's much more, much more concrete. So, uh, they converge geometrically to the whole space. Yes. And so, what I actually want to talk about in the last uh, 15 minutes is to sort of explore to what extent things like the fact that these powers are congruent, um, to what extent those sort of things are, are necessary. Um, and so, I'm going to um, show. Or the last thing I'll do is state a recent theorem with Jeff Brock, uh, or reasonably recent anyway, uh, which shows that sort of geometric convergence, certain kind of geometric convergence, is not enough to force this kind of torsion growth. So uh, for this, I let me first give a little definition. So, so I have my hyperbolic manifold here, right? Which I'll draw a dimension down out of lack of artistic skill. Uh, and if I pick a point on my manifold, well, it's locally like hyperbolic space. So if I take some small ball, radius epsilon or something about that, that's isometric to a ball in hyperbolic space. As I increase that radius, well, it probably stays uh, isometric. But eventually, you know, I'll expand it out far enough, and it'll bump into itself. Um, and the radius at which it does that is called the injectivity radius at that point. So the injectivity radius of the manifold at P um, I guess this is the supremum um, of the radii so that the ball about P of radius epsilon um, is, let's just say, it's embedded, I don't know, isometric to the corresponding ball in hyperbolic three space. So in other words, the small, based on this point, it's the smallest scale on which a, a metric neighborhood acquires any topology. Um, below that scale, you can't tell that you're not just in H3. Uh, and then often you'll look at the injectivity radius of the whole manifold, which would be just the infimum um, of the injectivity radius. So this, this maybe was a bad picture because there's not maybe a point in which it's probably obvious that occurs, but maybe it's over here somewhere. Um, so this is the smallest ball you can put anywhere. It's also this is just half the length um, of the shortest geodesic, shortest closed geodesic in your manifold. So my picture, maybe that's somewhere, somewhere over here. So the, conge the, the condition, I guess I never gave this condition a name for some reason. Maybe this is a good point in the talk since time is wearing on. Call this condition, these covers are exhaustive. And another way to phrase that, to have your exhaustive tower of covers, just means that the injectivity radius of the manifold of these covers goes to infinity. All right, the condition here is saying that you take any fixed loop in your manifold that's eventually not in, you know, maybe like the shortest geodesic, for example, is not in in the fundamental group of M4. Um, and so the length of the shortest GDs it grows up, goes up. And in fact, this uh, algebraic condition turns out to be exactly the same um, as uh, this here uh, geometric condition. But this, so that you can, one way to interpret, one way to uh, think about this, you have these sort of manifolds, the covers, these exhaustive covers, and on bigger and bigger scales, it's hard to tell these guys from H3. And so in particular, you fix some, some scale that you like, like radius 1,000. Then if you have exhaustive covers, eventually on that scale, you can't tell you're not in, in H3. Um, and it turns out for things that are analogous 
to this setup, except when you're talking not about the torsion in the homology, but just about, say, the Betty number, it turns out that geometric convergence of this kind is enough to force um, uh, is enough to force some kind of convergence of topology. So let me state, I guess maybe I should state first the result for Betty numbers for just a cohomology, and then I'll end with my theorem with Jeff. So let me state it this way. So, so let's say a sequence of hyperbolic manifolds So unlike before, these are no longer going to be covers of a fixed thing. This is just some infinite list of hyperbolic manifolds we found you know, um, in the gutter somewhere. So we have a sequence of hyperbolic MN. Uh, we'll say that these converge to H3. So this is in the sense of Benjamini Schramm. Um, if the following condition is true, um, so I guess one thing that will imply this, and if you're encountering for this for the first time, you might as well just take this as the definition. Um, it should just mean that the injectivity radius um, of these manifolds goes to infinity along this sequence. Now, in fact, you, you don't actually the right definition turns out to be the following, um, and that's just. It's that if you look on any fixed scale, the portion of the manifolds where the injectivity radius, which is some function of the point, is beneath that scale that has sort of small proportion. So if for all r greater than 0, if we look at the points in my manifold mn where the injectivity radius is less than r, so you should think of r being some big big number that you picked, uh, if you look at sort of the region of your manifold, which is kind of thin with respect to your fixed scale, that that should be an increasingly small portion um, of your manifold. All right, so that's some notion. Again, if you haven't seen this before, just think injectivity radius is getting big everywhere. So the theorem that one has. Uh, proved a couple years ago by a team of seven people. So I hope they will forgive me if I don't write out all their names. Albers, Bergeron, Beringer, uh, Galander, Nikolov, Ramont, and Smet, I think. So what they proved is that if we have a sequence of hyperbolic manifolds converging to H3, in the sense of, of Benjamini Schramm, um, then uh, if you look at the uh, just the rank of the first cohomology of these manifolds, right? This is some free abelian group. Um, then this actually normal this converges if we normalize appropriately. So if I divide this, it turns out the right thing to do is to divide this by the volume. Um, then this will go to zero. And one minute zero, of course, appears in many ways in mathematics, it's fair to say. Um, and, but this particular zero uh, is, this is the um, first L2 Betty number of hyperbolic three space. So there's some nice theory behind this, uh, which was studied by many people, especially Luke, um, in the context of covers of a fixed manifold. Uh, there's in great generality, much more than hyperbolic or whatever. You have if you take a tower of covers, and you normalize your ranks, your dimensions, Betty numbers, whatever you want to call them appropriately, uh, you get this kind of convergence to some kind of L2 invariant of the cover. Um, what they're showing is that in fact that 
convergence of topology, it's not necessary or in some sense even relevant that the manifolds be covers of a fixed thing. Right, this is just some arbitrary sequence which has this geometric convergence. So it certainly includes the kind of exhaustive towers of covers I was talking about earlier, but is much more general. And so that's really a remarkable fact that you get so much control out of what are, in some sense, entirely unrelated manifolds. And so the final thing I wanted to do was state a uh, result with Jeff Rock, which says that the convergence of torsion posited here by Lay and Bergeron and Venkatesh um, is more subtle than uh, what happens for the um, cohomology. So in particular, what we showed is that there exists a sequence Mn of, uh, yes, that's right. 1 over 6 pi is also a universal constant. And it's also, um, this is coming out, this is some kind of um, sort of L2 torsion, analytic racing or torsion of hyperbolic space. Yeah, so it's the same kind of analog. And so you might hope that this uh, torsion growth, uh, limiting to this L2 thing, should be forced just by the sort of benjarini schramm convergence. Um, and that turns out not to be true. So there exists a sequence of uh, Mn of hyperbolic manifolds, which uh, converge Benjamini Schramm to H3, where uh, every single one of them has no homology whatsoever. Um, so there's something. Uh, so I mean, this relationship between the torsion and the volume is some, well, I mean, it's some subtle and mysterious thing. Um, and I guess this the result is saying that it's saying that somehow, yeah, I don't because we don't really don't, we certainly I don't have a good understanding of, of what causes this, this torsion growth. It's not, unlike in this instance here, it's not just the fact that the homology um, is, is growing. Uh, and so we don't really have a good idea right now on what are the correct, for example, hypotheses here. How far can you push this? Uh, yes, yeah, so in these examples, so, so Mary asked, uh, do, is the injectivity radius going to infinity here, or is it just this? It's just this. Um, and I don't know if, if the injective radius goes to infinity everywhere. That might be enough to produce these torsion growth. And Jeff and I have tried to produce examples of that form, and we have failed. Yes? Uh, they're almost certainly non-arithmetic. I mean, it's a geometric construction. There would be no reason for them to be. And certainly you could arrange for them not to be if you preferred. OK. So um, all right, I think that's really most of what I wanted to tell you. I, I hope this talk sort of tried to, what I wanted to convey, actually, um, was just how, I mean, you know, in dimension three, you have this kind of amazing thing that topology uh, ends up being equivalent to geometry. I mean, you have all these geometric structures. In the most important generic case of hyperbolic geometry, um, that structure is unique. So it gives you some um, huge range of new topological invariants of a geometric flavor. Um, and then once you have this rigid um, geometric structure, it allows you at least sometimes to bring in tools from number theory um, and then study uh, these things. Um, and that's why I, I really enjoy working on uh, three manifold problems. So that's all I have to say, probably more than you wanted to hear. I'll stop there. Thanks for your attention.